Good morning to everyone. This is a very important week to many children this week and the next couple of weeks because, as you know, they will be starting back to school. Um, primary ages as well as college age students will be returning to school. But more important than that are the decisions they will be making once they get into that environment. As we all know, oftentimes it's an environment that is not conducive to spiritual principles and spiritual teaching from the Word of God. But even more important than that are the kind of regular associations, companions, regular companions, and friends that they will choose. In view of that, I've chosen this morning to speak on that subject. And since we're in the wisdom literature of the Bible, most of the passages we consider together this morning will be from the book of Proverbs. And the first passage to help us focus on the importance of making wise choices in our friends and regular associations is Proverbs 27. If you would look with me at Proverbs 27, please. Proverbs 27 and verse 17. Iron sharpens iron, and so one man sharpens another. In ancient times, the strongest metal known to man was iron. And so if you had a piece of iron you wanted to sharpen, the only thing that would sharpen it would be another piece of iron. Here's the positive side of human influence, of having good friends. A true friend will put an edge on your life. Just as iron sharpens iron, a truly good friend will sharpen good character. And so if you want to sharpen your faith in the Lord, then associate with people of iron faith in the Lord. If you want to sharpen the highest qualities of which God has created us capable of having and who wants us to have as his sons and daughters, then associate with people who have those kind of qualities and are growing along with you in qualities of love and kindness and mercy and gentleness and self-control and patience and so on and so forth. Things which Jesus called the weighty things in Matthew 23, 23. As iron sharpens iron, so a good friend will make you a better person in every way. And, and conversely, you will be making them a better person because they're also looking for that kind of iron quality in you. That door swings both ways. That street runs both ways. We're looking for good friends and we need to be a good friend. We need to be this kind of person as well as look for this kind of person. We see, we see both positive and negative aspects of this character in chapter 13 of Proverbs. Look with me there, please. Proverbs 13 and verse 20. He who walks with wise men will be wise, but the companion of fools will suffer harm. Run with fools, you'll become a fool. Associate with the wise, it will only help you to be wiser. So we see positive and negative sides of the kind of people, kind of friends we need to choose here. We're wise. If we associate with people who are spiritually wise, we're not talking about worldly wisdom here. We're talking about people who are spiritually wise, and we are foolish. 
if we associate with people that are worldly in their wisdom. That is, they have no moral compass other than themselves. They don't consider God. They don't make decisions based upon what God's word says and what Jesus would want them to say. They simply make decisions from themselves. Those are the kind of people you want to stay away from. They have no moral compass other than themselves. That kind of person will only legitimize sin. If you don't have the opportunity to sin, they will set it up. If you want to do something that is not right and your conscience is struggling in that matter, they will help you legitimize that situation. They'll justify it for you. Stay away from those kind of people. If you associate with fools, then the Bible says, then you'll become a fool. And Solomon is even more direct in this matter in chapter 14. Look at chapter 14 and verse 7. In verse 7 here, Solomon will go beyond the warning to a call for action. Look at this. Leave the presence of a fool. So if you associate with them, these are the consequences. Here he says, leave their presence or you will not discern words of knowledge. There's a consequence if you do not leave their presence. And then verse 9, he helps to characterize the foolish individual. Fools mock at sin, but among the upright, there is goodwill. Fools will only encourage sinful behavior. Any person that you're around that encourages something wrong or makes it easy to do something wrong or introduces that, stay away from that person. Leave the presence of a fool or you will not discern words of wisdom. He's not saying don't love them. He's not saying don't care about them. Certainly try to save them, try to lead them to the Lord. What we're talking about here, ladies and gentlemen, is regular associations, companions, uh, friends that you hang out with, you, you walk with. These are the, the kind of associations we're talking about here. Choose people of iron-type character, spiritually strong people. Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7 helps us to define the fool in the book of Proverbs. Proverbs 1, verse 7, he's someone who doesn't fear God. And in fact, he despises godly wisdom, Proverbs 1, verse 7 says. Here in chapter 14, he mocks at sin. Sin is no big deal to him. Again, he is worldly minded. He has no moral compass other than himself or herself. And so Solomon says, leave the presence of this individual or you will not know true knowledge, true wisdom. And let me add to that, what your parents have, have labored and prayed to do, right, mom and dad and grandma and grandpa for 18 years and beyond, what they've labored to instill in you can be lost and diminished in a relatively short period of time. You would be amazed how quickly that training can be diminished or forgotten in just a few months. 18 years to build can take just a few months to tear down if you associate with the wrong kind of people. I'm talking about, again, associations on a regular basis. Solomon says, don't join them, leave them. Leave those kind of associations. We are going to look at uh, one passage in the New Testament, 1 Corinthians 15, please. 1 Corinthians 15. Verse 33. Whether it's doctrinal or whether it's a moral issue, the principle is the same. Don't be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. Bad company corrupts good morals. Now, in giving a lesson like this, 
Some will still hear this message from the word of God, Proverbs, 1 Corinthians 15 here, and they'll say, well, that doesn't apply to me. I'm strong. I can, I can still choose whatever friends I want to choose. That will have no effect on me. Now, listen to me. God's word says it will. Do we think we're smarter than what God's word says? God's word says that will have an effect on us. And so if we want to have the kind of character, be the kind of people that God wants us to be, then choose wisely the friends and associations that uh, you're going to meet along life's way, whether you're in college, whether you're in elementary, junior high, or high school. It's so important to choose good associations, choose good friends. There are just fewer things in your age they are more important than that. I cannot emphasize that enough to you. Uh, I want to go ahead and have a living illustration of that, if, if, I, of a, if I may. Chanson, would you help me in this, please? Here's a willing person right here. Look at this. This, this, this guy deserves your commendation. Thank you. Would you get up in that chair for me, please? I'd set this up ahead of time. He knew. Yeah, go ahead, and, and I want you to stand up in there. Can you keep your balance stand in there? Yeah. All right. Well done. Well done. Okay, now here's what I'm going to do. Here's what I want you to do is we're going to grab hands here, and at the count of three, I want you to pull me up in that chair. Okay? At the count of three, I want you to pull me up into that chair. Okay? Ready? One. Better brace yourself. Two. Oh, wait a minute. I forgot to mention that while you're trying to pull me up, I'm going to do everything I can to pull you down, okay? It's a small detail, but uh, I, I do need to mention that, okay? So while you're trying to pull me up, I'm going to do everything I can within my power to pull you out of that chair. Are you ready now? Well, you're brave. One, two, no, just kidding. But do you see the point? Hop down if you would. Thank you. Thank you, Chanson. Thank you for being willing to be a part of this living illustration. I really appreciate that. That's very kind. Um, I, I would have asked Caleb. He might have fallen off, though. No, just kidding, Caleb. Um, so here's what God's Word says. God's Word says that when you're in regular association with someone who is evil-minded, that it's more likely that they will pull you down rather than you pulling them up to where you want them to be. So here you are, you love the Lord, you know the Lord, you want to grow in the Lord, but if you associate with someone who's evil-minded and worldly, it's more likely the Word of God says that they will pull you down because the whole time you're pulling this way, they're pulling the other way. We may not understand all of the psychology of that, but that's what God's word says. And so that's it. I hope I need to believe it. Hopefully you believe that. Bad company corrupts good morals. That's the way it is. Um, so what kind of friends should we choose and choose to be? Again, that's a two-way street. We've already seen from Proverbs 27, 17, that we need to look for and be ourselves iron-type characters. If we want to sharpen our faith in the Lord, if we want to have the highest qualities, attitudes of which we're capable and God wants us to have, we need to associate with those kind of people. We need to be in an environment that's conducive to that because it's, it takes growth and it's a process. We're all a work in process. So I need to be around those kind of people that's conducive to that, that end goal of being the best I can be for the Lord, and that's certainly what he wants. Well, let's go back to the Proverbs now, Proverbs 17, and uh, look at the kind of friend I need to be. Proverbs 17, please. Proverbs 17 and verse 17.
A friend loves at all times, and a brother is born for adversity. And so a good friend is steady. He's dependable. This spiritually minded person who you've been seeking for as an association, regular association, he's dependable. And even when we have to face the storms and the trials of life, we know he or she will not desert us. They'll walk with us through the valleys of life as well as in the peaks of life. And life is full of peaks as well as valleys. They will offer whatever help they can, even if it means just being with us sometimes. Even at times when we fail, a true friend, a good friend, won't desert us. They'll love us. They'll care about us, again, through the good and the bad. They'll help us get back up on our feet. A good friend is in it for the long haul. Of course, our best friend is Jesus. You're married in the covenant relationship of marriage. Again, all of these things would certainly apply there. That husband, that wife should be your best friend on earth. You're in it for the long haul. That's what God's word says through the peaks and the valleys, the good and the bad. That's what you promised. That was the covenant you made before God you made that covenant and before witnesses. You're in it for the long haul. A good friend is willing to suffer with us at times. It's a price we're willing to pay as their friend because that's what a good friend does. And you know what? Because we know your life is worth it. Your life is worth it. You're worth it. And so we're willing to pay that price. In chapter 27, chapter 27 of Proverbs and verse 6, faithful are the wounds of a friend. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. But deceitful are the kisses of an enemy. So that person telling you things that you may not like to hear, but are nonetheless true, they may be the best friend you have on earth. And that so-called friend that's unwilling to tell you the truth for fear of upsetting you may be the worst enemy that you have. A good friend will tell you the truth at all times, even if it hurts. Because it is the truth, and because he loves you enough to tell you the truth, and he or she believes in you enough to know you only want the truth, because you know that'll make you better, better than you are, and that's something we're always striving for. As one man said, give me the Bible truth over polished lies any day. Strong medicine over sugar pills. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. Deceitful are the kisses of an enemy. May we all have the heart of the psalmist in Psalm 119.63 who said, I am a companion of all those who fear you and of those who keep thy precepts, Lord. Those are the kind of companions we need to have. If you would uh, pick up the sheet that was handed out earlier by our brothers, and let's use this as a summary. And at the end of this summary sheet, this is such an important matter. I want us to be praying about it this morning as well as we are other times. And so I've asked Matthew to lead us in a prayer, especially about this, choosing good associations. And adults need to do that and be mindful of that just as much as children. But look at this, uh, this friendship. I call it a friendship measurement. Um, I, I put this together at a youth devotional some years ago and see if this is of some help to you as well. Suggestions to help you choose good friends. Number one, do they respect righteous principles and have right convictions themselves? They may not necessarily be a Christian, but they can have a respect for what is right and right principles. How is their manner of speech? Is it vulgar? Are they cursing? 
using that kind of speech? What's their lifestyle, their dress? Are they honest? Are they helpful? Are they considerate? Secondly, do they respect your convictions of faith? If they have no concern about violating your conscience and just keep suggesting things they know you believe are wrong, then why would you want to associate with someone like that? Such friends will keep suggesting things which will eventually wear your conscience down. They'll make sinning easy for you. Any person that keeps inviting you to do what's wrong is a bad friend. You need to leave the presence of that person. Third, do I desire their approval or acceptance too much? Is having their acceptance more important to me than, number one, my health? If I take foolish risk or do anything to harm my body, smoking, drinking, drugs, illegal drugs, as a result of peer pressure, coercion, being dared, ridiculed, having the fear of rejection, if I don't, then yes, I'm placing too much emphasis on peer acceptance. Peer pressure, peers, is simply someone who is equal standing with you and who will influence you. Usually, it will, he or she will influence you by using their acceptance or rejection of you as leverage, right? Adults do that as well as children. And so whose acceptance do you want more than anybody else? Hopefully, the Lord Jesus Christ and your parents who are godly and seeking what is best for you and not these, these earthly peers, whoever they may be. Do I desire their approval or acceptance too much? Number two, um, if having their acceptance is more important than obeying civil law. If I, if I disobey civil law, such as taking drugs, traffic laws, theft, then I'm desiring their acceptance too much. Third, obeying my parents. Your parents love you very much. They would sacrifice everything consistent with God's word for you. And so think about all the sacrifices they've made for you. If I do anything I know they would disapprove of as a result of peer coercion, then I'm placing too much concern on peer acceptance. Gospel says, obey your parents, not your peers. Fourth, life itself. If I do something which would place my life in danger, I'm placing too much concern on peer pressure. And then five, of course, God. If I do anything as a result of peer pressure which disobeys biblical teaching, not only moral but doctrinal, then I'm placing peer acceptance above God. Remember, your peers may be religious and pressure you to do something religiously which you know is not right. And, and that needs to be kept in mind as well. And if you want on the back of this sheet, things to help us overcome peer pressure. Number one, remember that peer pressure only has basis when it's grounded in scriptural teaching. It's not wrong to have or exert peer pressure. It depends on the basis of that influence, and it should be the Bible. Without scriptural teaching, it's nothing but Fear pressure. Fear pressure. Men and women hope you fear their rejection more than you fear God and his word. Adults, again, are just as guilty as children here. Secondly, desiring acceptance is a natural part of our makeup. But when I desire the acceptance of my peers so much, I'm willing to compromise faith and convictions that I've placed that above God. And then third, everybody's doing it. Well, it means somebody started it. One or two strong personalities started something, and the others follow like blind sheep. And instead of being one of the conforming sheep, learn to be original. Your ideas, your opinions, as long as they're scriptural, are just as valuable as everybody else's. And so why just go with the flow or take a course of least resistance when you can stand up and start the flow yourself? Why let others determine that? your lifestyle, your hair, hairstyle, your speech, your attitude, when you can read the Bible for yourself and see firsthand the standard which God would have you to follow. Don't be a blind sheep, be a shepherd. And then five or four, Christ has proven himself to be our greatest friend. He said, greater love has no one than this than one who would give his life for his 
his friends. He is our greatest friend. Never forget that. We should always fear his rejection more than that of men. And finally, great men of faith have succumbed to peer pressure. Peter and Aaron in the Old Testament. And so we should be on constant guard against it. Again, adults as well as children. Matthew, if you would uh, come to the front and uh, let's have a word of prayer, especially about this subject and especially in view of children going back into a, a tempting and difficult environment. Let's pray. <clears throat> oh Lord, we come before you, especially in thought of the youth of this congregation and the youth around us, all youth, oh Lord, knowing you can help every single one of them, but especially those who are in our midst, those that we know, the, knows, those that we love, our children, our grandchildren, our friends, our brethren. There are so many here that we know and trust have made good decisions in the past. We know that they, have, they are trying to do what is good and right. And we know that they and we stumble from time to time, but we come before you knowing that when we pray for them, we pray for ourselves, when we pray anytime that Lord, you will help. We know that because you promised that. And we know that when we pray, it's not simply because we ask, oh, Lord, we give you glory. But these youth, everyone, are helped when we pray and consider them and come before you and ask. We know that because you answer, oh, Lord, the power is in, within you. And we're grateful for that. We're grateful that we can come before you and be specific with our prayers. And we're grateful when we can be general, too. We're just thankful that we can pray to you and talk to you, O oh Heavenly Father. Thank you that we can right now consider them. Consider the youth as they go back to school, as they go before other young people, as they go before their teachers and adults, as they go before everyone, new faces, some they know, some they recognize, some they'll be in, joyous to be reunited with, and some new, Lord, help these youth. Help them in their efforts. Help them to fear you and keep your commands. Help them to make wise decisions. Oh, Lord, there's not any book that has ever been written. It, all works of antiquity, every work considered. I, I think about how ultimately it is the right and wrong decisions of man. And we pray that the youth will consider that in every decision that they make. Does this glorify God? Does this give praise and honor to God in heaven in every decision? Help them in that effort, oh Lord. Help them and the people they associate with to choose good friends, God-fearing friends. And those who choose not to fear you, oh Lord, help them in their efforts to teach them what is good and right, that they make good decisions just as iron sharpens iron, that they be sharpened by their company, by those they associate with. Help them in that decision-making process to know to turn to the left or to the right, to use your word as the ultimate guide and judge, to use your word as the wisdom in their lives. Help them in this effort. Help us as parents, as grandparents, as friends, as brethren, to also do these things, but to teach them these principles, these guidelines, these truths. Oh, Lord, we ask all these things through your son, Jesus, who is the, the light and, and life, who truly guides us, who is wise beyond comprehension, and who died on a cross to save us from our sins. Even when the youth make mistakes, they can look to him. Thank you for that. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Jesus said, greater love has no one than this who would give his life for his friends. 
And someone has well written, the test of love is the length to which it will go. Well, love went as far as it can go in the case of Jesus. He gave everything he could for us, proving he is our best friend. And then he says, you're my friends if you do what I command you. So there's no question about the friendship of Jesus. The only question is, are you and I his friend? And if so, will we keep his commandments? Right now, if you're not one of his children, we rejoice greatly at the salvation of Alexis Kemp. Wonderful, wonderful. There's nothing more wonderful than what she did and others have done in coming to God and his grace being seen in her life now, as well as so many lives here. And we'd love to rejoice with others who are ready to make that commitment to the Lord, give their lives to him, your greatest friend. Would you come at this time as we stand and sing, please?